Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily. We now turn to poem number 18 of the 1,775 poems of the Johnson edition. Uh, the uh, Jensen weaves her fringes. I find this a wonderful little poem where Emily, as iconoclast, as we've commented in earlier lectures, is going to be a radical new theologian, ending the poem with a new doxology. We'll, we'll obviously have to talk about it. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, our playlist, and that from our introductory lecture on, you've been with us, including up through and including the last poem, 17, Baffled, uh, for just a day or two. Now, uh, in terms of background information here, let's just remind ourselves how much Emily is a lover of nature. In fact, you'll remember we had the encounter in the garden in the very last poem, and here we're going to be playing around with the garden as well. And more particularly, this element of loss, this idea that summer has come and now summer is soon to pass. And what are the indicators that summer is on its way out? Well, in this case, it's going to be the wilting, the beginning of the wilting of the gents and the, this beautiful purple flower um, that will be a representative in so, in so many ways. In fact, Jensen will get used again in poem 20, and, um, and the word fringes will only get used one other time in poem 20. Let's just enjoy the poem. The Jensen wreaths her fringes, the maple's loom is red. My departing blossoms obviate parade. A brief but patient illness, an hour to prepare, and one below this morning is where the angels are. It was a short procession, the bubble link was there, an aged bead addressed us, and then we knelt in prayer. We trust that she was willing. We ask that we may be summer, sister, seraph. Let us go with thee, and in the name of the bee, and of the butterfly, and of the breeze. Amen. Now, I find it compelling that the last word of this poem, along with its exclamation point, Amen, is used one and only one time in our collection of all 1,775 poems. This is the only time. Some have seen this as a prayer uh, poem. Certainly, the word prayer is used. Notice, knelt in prayer. And yet, I'm going to point out that Dickinson loves to play around with these kind of sacred iconoclastic or icono, I, I, icons. She is iconoclastic through and through in so many ways. Let's enjoy the way that she'll play the game with us here. The Jensen uh, weaves her fringes. Can I just point out that we spent a lot of time talking about weaving when we did our lectures on the Odyssey. And you'll remember that we said that was one of those central motifs. Of course, Penelope weaving her famous cloak and all of that. The idea of weaving is for Emily, I think, much uh, of this she learned from her study of Homer is going to be central to the way she thinks about poetry and about life, the weaving. The Jensen weaves her fringes. I love that she uses the word fringes here and in poem 20, and it's the only time it gets used in all of her poetry. This is where Emily lives, is on the fringes. And I think this is the key word of the poem. She lives out there on the fringes. In the previous poem, it was the woods, and here it's the fringes, right? The maple's loom is red. In other words, we're coming to the fall. My departing blossoms obviate parade. This idea of obviating summer is ending, summer is going away. And this is the end of it. Notice the second stanza will begin with a brief but patient illness. In other words, she's going to recognize the passing of summer like an illness of a kind. Or she may be speaking ironically about how illness here is, is summer itself. An hour to prepare. In other words, it's as if the end of summer seems to happen so quickly. And all of a sudden, there it is. The uh, maples are turning red. The Jensen is, is, is starting to shrivel up. And it's like, oh, well, that's kind of sad, right? And one below this morning, that is to say the summer of 1858 is coming now to its end. One below this morning is where the angels are. In other words, summer has died, right? It was a short procession. Uh, in other words... There wasn't a lot of ceremony here with the passing of the summer of, of 1858. The bobolink, this North American singing bird that we've met already and we will meet many times. She loves this bird. The bobolink was there. Notice it's an aged bee. We'll come back to the name of the bee in her, in her holy trinity, her new trinity at the end. The aged bee addressed us. And then notice the plural of us. We, do, we knelt in prayer. Now, we're going we're gonna to play the game of the prayer and the doxology, this hymn uh, in praise to God at the end. Uh, an aged bee addressed us, and then we knelt in prayer. We trust that she was willing. We ask 
that we may be. Now, this is interesting, this idea of the willingness of summer to go ahead and pass. The hope that we can pass in the same way. I think there's, um, um, you know, there's so much of this, of the Phaedo and the passing of, of Socrates and the excitement of the journey. We've seen this before already in some of her poems. The idea that studying nature and studying summer and moving into fall or autumn is, is a way to prepare for the end of one's life. And certainly Emily is very much going to be focused on that. Notice we have this three, the, the, again, the trinities. Summer, sister, seraph, exclamation point. Let us go with the exclamation point. I'd like to point out that this let us go construction is one that I think T.S. Eliot learned from this poem, and, 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 and he loves it in his uh, uh, Prufrock uh, song of J. Alfred Prufrock, Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon her table. Some of that patient uh, and, and that idea of illness is, I think, born of a poem like this. And then finally, we have our doxology, this brief hymn, right, of celebration to God. In the name of the bee, and, but we have a new trinity. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. It's in the name of the bee. We already saw the aged bee. Of the butterfly, that's not mentioned in the poem, but it makes, makes sense that it would be here. And of the breeze. Notice that we got bees, butterflies, breeze. It's brilliant the way she, play, she plays with language. And then again, the dash. Only now, the amen exclamation point. And again, the only use of the word amen in all of her poetry is right here. I'm fascinated by the way that she will use this word as the last. It's a prayer. And what is the prayer? Well, it, it, 2A, it's hard to let go. Let go of summer, let go of life. What will it be like to be in that position of, of uh, uh, Plato's Phaedo for Socrates? There's the hemlock. There's the cup. Is it, it's time to go on the, the next voyage, right? And, uh, and again, we're back to our Homer. At to be, I love Emily, the iconoclast who lives on the fringes. Um, and she's creating this trinity at the conclusion, this doxology at, at the end. Emily's readers of her own day would understand the game she was playing here. And it's certainly a game. I think she's having a lot of fun as she's playing this, as we said in earlier lectures, not only of Emily, but as well our, our, our talks with Walt. Um, at 3A, I've mentioned, of course, the Phaedo. I think so much of Socrates and Plato is behind a lot of what Emily does. I mentioned the love song of G. Alfred Prufrock as well, this Let Us Go, Then You and I. Um, we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net on those texts. At 3B, well, how about this to, to relate this poem now to you personally? What was a time when you had to let go of summer, either literally or metaphorically? And, and you were aware of it, you were conscious of it, and did you have some sense of the kind of prayer that maybe that you prayed? I hope Emily is challenging you to learn how to pray in all different ways. Thank you.